Welcome everyone to the per session. I'm Dr. Andrea Ruda. I'm an assistant professor at the Ohio State University and I'm an epidemiologist by training. Um, my research appointment at OSU involves many projects related to swine health and production and many of them are focused on PERS occurrence and spread within and between swine farms. I'm happy to be sharing this session today and I thank the organizing committee for this opportunity even though we are all learning in this new online environment. So we, get, we have a great lineup of speakers today and topics. And as we know, PERS continues to be an ongoing challenge to swine producers and veterinarians, and there is still a lot of unknowns when it comes to this virus. Um, today's presentations will cover uh, PERS persistence in breeding herds, classification of viruses using whole genome sequencing, as well as a revised way to classify PERS at the herd level. So let's start with our first speaker. Dr. Mariana Kikuchi from the University of Minnesota. Uh, Mariana currently works as a researcher at the Morrison Swine Health Monitoring Program. She started that in 2018. She graduated with her DVM from Federal University of Paraná back in 2010. And then after that, she completed a residency in zoonosis and public health, and she obtained both a master's and a PhD in public health epidemiology at the Federal University of Bahia, also in Brazil, from 2014 to 2018. Her presentation today is entitled Understanding PERS Virus Diversity at the Pig and Leader Levels Using Whole Genome Sequencing. And she will describe some preliminary results from overall within leader and within piglet PERS virus genetic diversity in a farm that was undergoing a PERS outbreak. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to present a little bit of our project on understanding PERS diversity. Um, and just I wanted to start with a disclaimer that I'm not a virologist, I'm an epidemiologist, so I might not focus too much in um, the molecular methods here, but I hope to be able to provide some epidemiological insights on PERS viral diversity. So with that, I would like to start um, with just the basic question of why would we want to understand viral diversity of PERS? And I think the main reason would be to try to get some information regarding disease dynamics out of the molecular data. Um, so I think we basically have two main focus when we want to understand viral diversity, which are, first of all, we want this uh, genetic uh, information to be able to provide us, uh, to help us with outbreak investigations and this would be important because we want to be able to uh, identify possible events of viral introductions in, in farms, but we also want to be able to monitor viral persistence uh, on farms that are undergoing elimination. And I would say that perhaps the second uh, main reason for us to understand viral diversity would be um, to try to get some sense of the immunological role that this uh, virus might, might uh, have. So uh, with that, I mean that uh, we want to, uh, we assume that there is variable cross protection between heterologous infections. So um, whenever a herd becomes infected with a virus, we assume that if the herd becomes exposed again with a very similar virus, we, we hope that the herd will have some immunity against it. So identifying which virus we have uh, might be useful in order to uh, help decisions regarding either using a commercial vaccination or live virus inoculation, or maybe both, uh, when we are planning uh, control and prevention strategies. However, to the date, what defines a heterologous virus in terms of PERS is still a matter of debate. So with that, the main goal of this project is to characterize PERS viral diversity um, within naturally infected piglets uh, following an outbreak. And the this main specific goal of this project is, uh, again, to estimate the overall genetic diversity within the piglet population in a farm, but we also want to be able to compare genetic diversity within and between leaders and within the host at different points in time. And with that, we hope to be able to determine um, patterns of microevolution in the end. And um, yeah, that's what we hope to get with this study. So to try to answer these questions, uh, we designed a cohort of piglets from one feral to win farm uh, that was undergoing a first outbreak. So the farm that we selected 
was um, it had a naive herd for over two years and it broke with birth on May 21st. Um, after that, the, the, they decided to perform LVI uh, in all sows and all gutes uh, with the recently introduced virus. So the LVI was done nine, nine days after the virus was detected in the farm. And then our research team went to the farm two weeks after LVI was done, so pretty close to the live virus inoculation. And we sampled all piglets from all three to five days old leaders uh, that were present at the farm on the date of the sampling. So with that, um, we ear tagged every animal that we collected, um, that we collected blood, and we followed these animals individually for up to 17 weeks. So there's an, an schematics here in the bottom of our sampling points. So the first sampling point was when they were three to five days old, which is what we are calling the farrowing sampling, um, followed by another, a second sampling close to weaning when they were around 19 days old. Then we had two additional samplings at the nursery site, followed by one uh, sampling point at the finisher site. So again, since we uh, ear tagged those animals and we were able to identify which were the ones that um, were present in each sampling point, um, we were able to follow them in time and see which ones were alive by the end of the study period. So we started with 127 animals um, at the farrowing um, sampling and we ended up with only 22 live animals. That gives us a cumulative mortality of 83%, as you can see here in this graph. And you can see also that the bulk of the mortality occurred between the farrow and weaning sampling points, followed by the period between weaning and the first um, nursery sampling point. Again, uh, since we had individual blood samples from these animals, we were able to test them uh, for PCR for PERS. Um, and the interpretation for PERS PCR is whenever we have a CT value of 40 or above, we consider that sample to be negative. And whenever we have a sample, a CT value of um, less than 40, we consider the sample to be positive. And there's a correlation between CT value and viral load. So the, lowest, the lower the CT value, the higher the viral load that was present in that sample. So we can see here from this graph that in the first sampling, the farrowing sampling, all animals were positive with very low CT values. You can also see that the CT values increase through time to the point that at the nursery two um, sampling, um, most of the animals were still positive, however, with a higher CT value, uh, but some had turned negative. And by the finisher sampling point, uh, all of the animals were negative for PERS. So we can say that uh, viremia persisted for up to 11 weeks for most of these animals. Regarding um, the sequencing results, we weren't able to test all of the samples yet. Um, but again, we submitted the samples uh, for menial sequencing uh, individually. So, so far we performed sequencing in 120 samples and we chose uh, to focus first on the farrowing and weaning samples uh, and particularly on the ones from animals that were followed in these two sampling points. Um, so amongst these 120 samples, we were able to obtain a consensus whole genome sequence from for 114 samples. Uh, however, we found a lower quality of the sequences uh, on the regions ORFON A and ORFON B. So we decided to not assess these regions and only assess ORFs 2 to 7 from uh, now on in, in our analysis. Additionally, uh, we also had samples that had only a partial sequence in any of these, in some of these ORFs uh, that we are using. So if any sample had any partial sequence in whatever these ORFs from two to seven, we excluded the whole sample from the analysis. So in the end, uh, we are now using 101 consensus sequences, uh, 54 of them were from the farrowing sampling and 47 from the weaning sampling. Here's just to recap uh, how the PERS virus genome is 
construct is uh, organized and we can see here on the top right corner of the slide that we are actually working going to work with all of the structural genes uh, from the first genome so we're going to be working with ORFs 2 to 7. Uh, there are several functions uh, for the protein, proteins that these ORFs uh, encode, um, but here are some of them, uh, and we can, we can see that most of them are related to either virus infectivity or viral recognition by neutralizing antibodies. So there will be two ways in which we will be comparing these sequences. The first of them is um, just by describing the percent nucleotide identity range. And just in case anyone in the audience is not familiar with percent nucleotide identity, it's basically how many um, nucleotides are exac exactly the same between two sequences. So we can see here in this example that the first sequence is exactly the same as the second sequence, so they have 100% um, identity. However, the, the first sequence is only 99.8% identical to the third sequence. And that is because we found a mutation um, on the third to last position from a G to a C. So again, percent nucleotide identity, we are comparing one sequence, sequence to another one, so a two by two. And what this will give us in the end is a matrix such as like this one in the slides, in which, for example, A, B, C, and D are different sequences and we are comparing sequence B with sequence A, C with A, B with C, and so on and so forth. So let's assume that this matrix here is, for example, um, regarding the sequences that we obtained in our first sampling at the farrowing. We would say, for example, that the minimum percent identity found was 98.4% and the maximum was 100%. We can go a little bit further and assume that um, sequences A, B, and C were from animals from the same litter. So then we would say that the minimum percent identity within litter was 99.8% and the maximum was 100%. So this is the results that we found with our 101 sequences looking at ORFs 2 to 7. So in this table here, sampling 1 represent the sampling uh, closer to farrowing when they were three to five days old. Sampling two represent the sampling closer to weaning when they were around 19 days old. And within animals means that for the, those animals in which we have uh, those two sampling samples, uh, we are actually comparing these two sequences from the farrowing to the sequence uh, from weaning. Um, as you can see here, the maximum percent identity was always 100% in all of these comparisons meaning that we always had one sequence that was completely identical to another. Uh, so in this case, the minimum might be a little bit more informative for us in regards to uh, viral diversity. So for sampling one, we can see that the overall minimum percent identity was 99.84% and the within leader was 99.88%. So both are pretty high. However, it shows us that we did find some differences between sequences. If we look at sampling two, the overall and the within leader minimum percent identity was 99.57%, again, pretty high. However, a little bit lower than what we found in sampling one. The within animal minimum percent identity was 99.65, showing us that again, uh, even in this shorter period of around two weeks between farrowing and weaning, we did find some uh, consensus difference uh, within the same animal. So the second way which we'll be comparing these sequences is um, by comparing the percent nucleotide identity to the overall consensus. So previously what we were doing is we were comparing each sequence to all others and trying to understand the range of percent nucleotide identity. What we're going to do right now is we're going to compare each sequence to the same reference and the reference in this case will be the consensus. So again, just in case anyone in the audience is not familiar, uh, for the consensus, we were going to have um, the most frequent nucleotide found in each position. So for example, here uh, in position 450, all sequences had a C, so the consensus on the top there will have a C as well. If we look at position 482, 
we can see that most sequences had a C, however, some had A's, some had, had T's. So the consensus will give us the most prevalent one, which was in this case C. So again, we're always gonna be comparing each sequence to the same reference from now on. So this is what we found. In the y-axis, we have percent nucleotide identity, and in the y-axis, the x-axis, we have uh, liter numbers by sampling point. So we can see here, for example, that for sampling one, we found that um, most of the sequences were 99% or above um, similar to the consensus. However, in sampling two, although most of the sequences were still 99.9% .9 or above um, identical to the consensus, we can see that for liter 10 and liter 12, um, there is some more diversity, some more variability. They are a little bit more different than the consensus than the rest of the sequences. So this was pretty intriguing. And what we decided to do now was instead of looking at ORFs two to seven, we, are, we decided to look at each ORF separately to try to understand where this, this diversity is coming from. So we did the same two analyses. So this table uh, represents the same thing as we were discussing before. And the first column is regarding ORFs two to seven, which we already discussed. So I'm basically showing the same thing for each separate ORF. Again, you can see that the maximums were always 100%, meaning we always had one sequence that was completely identical to at least one other. So let's just again look at the minimums uh, as they will give us a little bit more information regarding uh, viral diversity. And we can see just looking overall that the minimums were also pretty much really high, around 99%, perhaps a little bit um, higher even, uh, with some 98.9. Uh, however, what caught our attention was ORFs 4 and ORFs 5A, in which we can see that, uh, for example, for ORF 4, particularly in sampling 2, the minimum percent identity found was 95.8, both overall and within liter, and the within animal minimum percent identity was 97.2%. For ORF 5A, what caught us caught our attention particularly was the overall uh, minimum in sampling one, which was 97.7, and the rest of the comparisons for R5A were around 98.5%. So again, we decided to explore a little bit more of these two ORBs. And this is the same analysis as we did before, but now we are comparing only at the R4 region, um, each sequence to the consensus. So we can see here that the sampling one, um, most of the sequences were actually 100% identical to the consensus. However, if we look at the sampling two, again, most of the sequences were 100% identical to the consensus, but liters 10 and 12 are again different. Um, for R5 in particular, uh, the analysis that we usually do in a routine basis uh, it's not uncommon for people to use a 98% identity cutoff to determine whether if a sequence is different or similar to another one. So if we were to apply the same concept here for our form, we would perhaps say that at least for some of the sequences in liter 12, that we have diff a different sequence that, than what we see in, in the other animals. So apparently there's something going on particularly in liters 10 and 12. If we look at R5A, we can see here the same graph. Um, again, comparing only the R5A region, uh, I would like to point out that the y-axis for the percent nucleotide identity changed. Just wanted to zoom in a little bit so we can see these differences a little bit closer. Uh, but basically, um, the percent identity was overall pretty high, most above 99%, but we also didn't have any sequence that were less than 98% identical to the consensus. So in summary, what we are finding so far is that um, the viral diversity within the piglet population within one farm is generally small. Most of the sequences are very similar to each other. However, diversity, a higher diversity was found in ORFs 4 and 5A, 
and those two regions were also previously described as having a high diversity in previous studies. But for R5A in particular, um, I would like just to point out that this is a shorter segment. We're talking about 150 base pairs approximately compared to, for example, R5, which has uh, around 603 base pairs and R4, which has around 530 base pairs. So, so because this is a shorter segment, the impact of a higher, of the impact of a single mutation in the percent nucleotide identity is going to be much higher, just because we are comparing a percentage in a shorter segment. Uh, however, uh, the region of R5A overlaps almost completely with the beginning of the R5, and this region of R5 particularly. Um, there were sites under selective pressure there that were previously described. So we would indeed expect to see some uh, variation in this region. So regarding the higher diversity in R4 particularly, uh, this is explained mainly by these four animals, one from litter 10 and three from litter 12, the ones that we were discussing before. And these are the ones that we are showing here in this figure. So we can see on top the consensus sequence and the ones that we are talking about are barcodes 105, 110, 111, and 112. So we can see that these sequences are, are perhaps around 15 to 20 base pairs different from the consensus. And if we take into consideration that first mutation rate has been estimated to be around 10 to the minus two mutations per site per year. And we are talking about um, these different sequences here being identified um, two weeks apart from the first sequence, from the first sampling point at, at the farrowing. It's just too short of a period for us to expect that these mutations um, are occurring naturally. So from now on, we can only uh, speculate what might explain these findings and one possible explanation could be maybe a lab or a sequencing error and for that I would say that uh, if this were a sequencing error we would expect it we would expect to see it randomly occurring um, amongst our sequences and not mostly cluttered in one data. Uh, if this were a, a lab error in the sense that um, maybe we had some cross-contamination with other samples. Um, in this case, we would expect to see um, sequences that were completely identical to each other if they were um, products of cross-contamination, which again, it's not what we are seeing here. So we don't think that this is the most, most likely explanation for these findings. So possible other explanations could be um, maybe the farm was still experiencing other viral introductions during this two week period. This is a possibility. Or perhaps that what we are seeing here actually is uh, the turnover of a co-circulating virus that was not detected in the first sampling. And this is because um, if you remember, we sampled all of the animals that were three to five days old that were present in the farm. However, we didn't sample the entire herd. We didn't sample the older piglets or the sows. So perhaps, um, although we did capture probably uh, the most prevalent viruses that were circulating, we might not have captured all of them. And by the second sampling, those uh, viruses that were present at lower, lower prevalence in the beginning were now becoming more and more prevalent. That could be a second explanation as well. So with that, um, some take home messages from what we're seeing so far. Uh, first of all, again, we saw a small overall viral diversity within the piglet population of one farm. Um, and that was more or less what we expected. But if we look particularly at the R5, and if we were to apply that 98% cutoff, um, piglets might be going to the growing finisher sites uh, with different viruses than the ones that were identified closer to farrowing. And this is important because uh, we don't always know what's going on downstream and we always assume, I mean, we could assume uh, that the first virus that we identify is the one that the piglets are bringing into the growing finishing sites and that might not be the case. 
So just for us to be aware of what might be going on on these sites as well. And then lastly, uh, we did find within animal consensus changes in a period as short as two weeks, um, which again, we can't really explain how this occurred, but it was a quite interesting result. And if we consider that viremia persisted for up to 11 weeks in most of these animals, um, we really look forward to seeing what the sequencing of the rest of the samples will show us, particularly because we have different stages in which these animals will be possibly commingling with other animals, um, but also will be starting to develop um, some immunity as well. Uh, and we hope that this will provide us inf important information on within individual viral evolution. So with that, I would like to thank everyone that uh, was involved in this research. Particularly, I would like to thank the sponsors, BI and SDC. And I would also, also like to thank Soin Bed Center and Rick's New Farms for allowing this project to, um, to occur. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mariana, for your great presentation. I'd like to now introduce our second speaker, who is Dr. Marcelo Almeida from Iowa State University. Marcelo is currently a PhD candidate at ISU, and he also is serving as a diagnostician at their VDL. Marcelo received his DVM from the University of Brasilia in 2003, followed by a master's degree in 2006 from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, both in Brazil. Before coming to Ames, uh, Marcelo worked in the swine industry for over 17 years, and he had very diverse roles, including being a veterinarian in a vertically integrated pork production system. He also worked with genetic suppliers and a pharmaceutical company. Marcelo's presentation today is entitled PERS Virus Persistence in Breeding Herds, Update on Recent Findings. And Marcelo will cover what we know so far in regards to PERS virus persistency at the individual and herd level. He will also discuss factors that might be contributing to prolonged PERS virus detection in breeding herds and sample collection techniques. So I'd like to thank the Lemon Organizing Committee for inviting me today to give this presentation to you guys. And today the topic is uh, PERS persistence in breeding herds and update on recent findings. Uh, here I have an agenda that we will cover for this presentation. We'll start with what we know about PERS persistence and then we will try to understand that uh, if that's impacting herd closures and if those are becoming longer. Then we'll talk a little bit about uh, different techniques on, on, on for, to detect PERS, especially in the farrowing room and how that may be impacting our ability to uh, find PERS in those breeding herds and this perception that we may have PERS persisting long, in, long for longer times in breeding herds. And then we will start our, uh, the end of our journey with a few remarks on uh, when our herds might be uh, negative. Uh, and we then have the, the final slide with the conclusions. So we start here with the, what we know about pers pers persistency today. And here we will be talking a little bit about uh, what, uh, how long we can detect pers in, blood and also in other tissues. And then we, in the next slide, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, transmission of PERS, what we know in the individual level. So in terms of viremia, uh, we know that adult animals, they have a shorter uh, period of viremia compared to uh, younger pigs. Uh, and this can also be shortened for even further if the animal has had previous contact with PERS uh, before, or in other words, these animals have some sort uh, or some level of uh, immunity uh, due to prior contact with the virus. But we have reports of detection of PERS in blood of uh, up to 
251 days post-infection uh, via detection by PCR, uh, with isolation of up to 56 days from serum in this study from Wales in 2003. Talking about tissues, uh, we have a variety of studies that were able to detect uh, true virus isolation in for oropharyngeal scrapings in this first study here, also by, by Will in 157 days post-infection. The second one, we had 86% uh, of the pigs with oropharyngeal scrapings or tonsil uh, uh, detection between 63 and 105 days post-infection. Molina reported in 2007 uh, detection in lymphoid tissue for a little over 200 days. And finally, in piglets that were infected in utero, we have RNA detection in serum uh, up to 210 days after birth and isolation from tonsil and scrapings up to 157 days. Now, this is detection, talking about a little bit in terms of transmission. We have different studies. In these first two studies here, we are just talking about detection in bioassay where they were uh, collecting harvesting tissue from animals that were previously infected with PERS and tried to infect uh, naive animals uh, with those tissue homogenates. And they were able to do that uh, with uh, up to 175 days post-infection from those, from those animals. And in terms of transmission from uh, previously infected animals to non-viremic sentinels, we have two studies here that showed uh, that was transmission was possible uh, from 62 to 86 days post infection, which is a pretty long time. Uh, transmission here in, a, in another study when, I, again, piglets were infected in utero and they were able to transmit PERS to sentinel, sentinel animals for up to 112 days after birth. And another interesting piece of information that we have here at the end is that uh, in this study by Albin and collaborators in 1994, we have reactivation of shedding after corticosteroid treatment after uh, 14 weeks after initial circumversion of those animals. And why is that important? Well, that's important because in situations of stress, we could could have animals uh, shedding again, and you know that could be a, a possible way of transmission within herds. For example, when animals are being transported to other barns or uh, around parturition, that could be a stress that could be re reactivating shedding. Uh, but all these are talking about in the individual level. Uh, here, just to complement. Uh, this information. We had uh, Dr. Enal Diaz published this paper in 2020 where she did a meta-analysis compiling information from several different studies and we're going to focus here on this, on this green line here which is uh, the line of bioassay and what she was showing here through her calculation is that even after 170 days, 75 days post-infection with uh, PERS virus or MLV, there was still a probability of detecting PERS virus through PERS virus through bioassay in 7% of the animals. In other words, a very long period of uh, persistence of PERS virus in those, in those individuals with the ability of transmitting it to other animals. In other words, we have some infectious virus still active after 170 days uh, post initial infection of those animals. And like I said, again, this is information specifically in individual animals. Now, when we start to talk a little bit about the impact in, in breeding herds, one of the questions that we have is that if our herd closures are becoming longer. And here we have two uh, uh, very important uh, studies where Linares and, and collaborators were trying to estimate the time to stability uh, for di different groups of farms. In this first study here that was published in, 
in 2014, the median time to stability for the herds that were included in this study was about three weeks, compared that to the second study here, about 44 weeks. Another good information was the longest time to stability in this first study, about 54 weeks, which was similar to the second study, 52 weeks. But in the first study, about 80% of the herds achieved the stability, while only 67% of the study of the herds in the second study um, achieved its stability. It's important to, to uh, mention here that in this second study, the primary goal of the veterinarians uh, was actually to control PERS. Uh, while in this first study, the primary goal was to eliminate. So in this second study, a lot of the herds were not implementing herd closure procedures, while in this first study, um, all of the herds implemented herd closure. And here we also have a more diverse uh, uh, groups or patterns of our FLP, while in this uh, second study, we are mainly focused on 174. Uh, another set of studies that I wanted to bring to your attention here is this study that was published by Trevisan and he was evaluating actually uh, breeding herds that were in the batch fairing system, uh, fairing every four weeks and he was evaluating using processing fluids and the time to stability here was defined as two consecutive processing fluids results so by about eight weeks of uh, negative uh, testing. 97% uh, of those herds achieved stability and we had about a median time of about 27 weeks uh, to achieve that time to stability, but, but with the longest TTS of about 55 weeks, which was uh, also similar to what we saw in the previous two studies. But in this study here, published in 2018 from uh, San Juez and collaborators, we had a time to stability of about 41 weeks with the longest time to stability of 163 weeks. 96% of the herds achieved the stability. But in this case, another interesting remarking of this, uh, remark of this study was that 92% of the farms actually achieved the stability uh, by 74 weeks uh, after, after they started uh, the elimination procedure. So, it was interesting to see that uh, really in this study, uh, they found that the, the, the time to stability was getting a little longer. Now, uh, one other piece of evidence that we have is that we've been adding these new tools, this mainly these population tools. And here we have two charts that were monitoring two different farms, showing data from two different farms with processing fluids. And what we see is that after implementing those procedures to try to eliminate PERS virus, the, these herds show, uh, uh, you know, that they are able to detect PERS virus in processing fluids through PCR by a very long time, for a long, very long time. So in this case here, uh, up to 54 weeks and they were not, they were still not finding consistent negative results. And in this, in this case here, up to 49 weeks, they were still finding PERS virus uh, in processing fluids. So we've been uh, in communication with different systems that they have re re been reporting uh, situations like this where they are still able to find PERS virus for a very long time, even, uh, you know, even sometimes after a year that they've been implementing uh, procedures to try to eliminate it from, from the cell farms. So that brings us to this next part where we have uh, the detection of PERS in nursing piglets, which usually the target uh, to try to detect PERS uh, the target population to try to detect PERS in breeding herds. And like I said, we have introduced uh, different population uh, techniques 
uh, or sample types, which are processing fluid and familiar of fluids and others. And we also use some traditional serum sample sampling from piglets. And we're going to comment uh, in different things that we have been doing to try to improve uh, the detection of PERS virus in breeding herds using those three different sampling uh, methods. So talking about serum, here we have a table uh, that all of you know, uh, you've seen this before. This is from Chase and Paulson from a paper published in, in one, uh, the 2000 AASV. And here we have the sample size requirements to detect disease in a given prevalence with a certain confidence for uh, different population sizes here. So we are all familiar with this, with this table. But this table is also uh, something that's very similar to what we have in, in other uh, seminal uh, papers like Cannon and Row from 1982. And those, uh, the calculations that are used to provide these guidelines are based on two different assumptions. The hypergeometric distribution, which uh, says, which talks about the chance of uh, success of finding, uh, in our case here, a viremic piglet, uh, a viremic piglet in a finite population without replacement of those uh, piglets. So you don't sample the same piglet uh, twice. And the other assumption is simple random sampling. So what does that mean? Does, that means that we should have a homogeneous population. So what does that mean? That means that uh, in our case, you're talking about is that the disease should be, or the target that we are looking for should be homogeneously distributed in the population. In other words, every piglet should have an equal chance of being pers viremic in the population that we're looking for. In this case, a ferrum room. Uh, and to test for this, the, we, we used two approaches in this study that I'm going to show you. One was to test for homogeneity of disease among leaders using Fisher uh, exact test. And, and I'm, I'm going to show you what that uh, should look like in the next few slides. And I'm also going to show what we did to test for clustering or clustering of viremic piglets within the room. And to test for that, we use the permutation test uh, with simulation and uh, measuring Euclidean distance between the viremic piglets. And I'm going to show, to explain that a little better in the next few slides. So talking about uh, the homogeneous population in regards to PERS. So let's just imagine that this is a ferry room. Here we have different crates, about 15 crates with a, a number of uh, piglets within uh, each of those leaders. Now let's introduce some, some piglets here. So blue piglets are piglets that are uh, tested negative by PCR. And the red ones would be piglets that are very viremic or found positive in serum uh, by PCR. And what we see here uh, in this slide is that the piglets that are red in color or which would be viremic, they are not distributed, distributed uniformly across the different leaders. So this would be what we call a non-homogeneous distribution, which is equal to say a heterogeneous distribution of the viremic piglets within the room. Uh, next, uh, we would have a distribution that would be distribution of the viremic piglets within uh, the room or in each of those leaders that would look a little bit like this. And these would be more like what the homogeneous distribution uh, of viremic piglets would look like in the different, across the different leaders. So each of those leaders would have a similar within leader prevalence. Uh, and that's what we tested for. So this would be what we call a homogeneous distribution of viremic piglets within those, room, those, those rooms and across the different leaders. Next, I'm going to show you a little bit about how we tested for clustering. So for clustering, 
we attributed coordinates for each of those leaders. And just an as, as an example here, in the x-axis uh, and in the y-axis, we would have these coordinates. This leader, for example, would have a x coordinate of two and a y coordinate of four. So every piglet in this leader would have these exact same coordinates. And by that, in using that information, we would be able to calculate the average disease center for this room, or the average, we would be doing that by averaging the coordinates of each of those viremic piglets. So for this room, for example, this point would be right here. This would be the average coordinate of all of those viremic piglets. And next, we would use, uh, we would calculate the Euclidean distance, which would be the distance of the viremic piglets to the center of disease of the room. And we would be doing that using some mathematics uh, of the Pythagoras theorem by calculating this distance C from the center of the coordinate where the viremic piglet is to the center of disease. So we would repeat that process for each of those viremic piglets. And with that, we would be able to calculate what's the average distance of each of those viremic piglets to the disease center. Now comes the simulation part of the permutation. We would allow those pigs to actually uh, randomly reallocate within the room, like if there were no crates anymore or no litter structured, and those piglets would be, uh, you know, randomly mixed and they would return to each of those different litters with the only restriction that the uh, same number of piglets of the original litters have to be in place after remixing. So here we have a different configuration of the room with the, after they were, piglets were shuffled randomly throughout the room. And then we repeat that process of trying to find the disease uh, center by average the coordinates of those viremic piglets again. Then we measure the Euclidean distance again and recalculate what was the average distance of the positive pigs to that disease center. And we compare that to the uh, original or to the observed distribution of the, that we saw with the data. Now, the smaller this distance is between the disease center and the, the average distance of the, of the uh, viremic piglets to that disease center, the less cluster or the more clustered this distribution is. And the larger the average distance of the viremic piglets to the disease center, the less clustered that distribution is. So we did this process about 10,000 times to calculate the probability that uh, the observed data followed within the simulated da data when the piglets were allowed to move randomly within the room. And here we have the results of both of, of that homogeneity analysis and the clustering. So what I want you to focus in here, so we are comparing the expected uh, um, results if those uh, viremic piglets were homogeneously distributed across the leaders and here the observed results. Here we have the p-values of uh, that comparison for the Fisher test and what I want to bring your attention to here is that from all of these rooms here that are about 16 rooms only one room was actually uh, had a, a what was considered to be a homogeneous distribution. So to have a homogeneous distribution was actually rare in, in, in all of these different populations that we uh, analyzed in here. And on top of that, clustering nodes was also detecting the majority of, uh, of, of those room tests tested. So what we saw here is that really the one of the key assumptions for those tables that we saw before, they are not met. And now what are the implications of that for surveillance? So what we did next was to compare uh, simple random sampling 
to what we are calling here to a stage stratified sampling and risk-based sampling. So simple random sampling, which would entail uh, random selection of, of the piglets in, in the room. Two stage stratified sampling would be first selecting uh, which leaders are going to be sampled randomly and then selecting uh, piglets with, uh, randomly within those leaders. In risk-based sampling, in this study, we found that uh, leaders coming from parity one cells were at, at a high risk of being uh, viremic and also leaders that had uh, equal to or less than 12 piglets. So we compared uh, the number of samples necessary to detect at least one viremic piglet in each of those uh, observed scenarios here. And what we found is that simple random sampling uh, in the majority of the situation was uh, better in detecting uh, at least one viremic piglet than simple random sampling. So in other words, it was more efficient because it required fewer samples than simple random sampling to detect uh, at least one viremic piglet. Now comparing uh, risk-based sampling with two-stage sampling, in, in a lot of the situations here, uh, risk-based sampling also required fewer samples than two-stage sampling to detect the same prevalence. In a few other situations, they were equivalent, and in rare situations, two-stage two sampling uh, required fewer samples than risk-based sampling to detect um, uh, at least one viremic piglet. So risk-based sampling on average was better than two-stage sampling uh, on, 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 or was more efficient, it required less, fewer samples to detect at least uh, one positive piglet. So key message here, risk-based sampling was better at detecting PERS, viremic piglets than two-stage sampling, and that was also better than simple random sampling. Uh, just giving a few extra points here, talking about processing fluids, Linares and, and Lopez uh, put together this chart showing that the more uh, you accumulate negative results in processing fluids over time, uh, the lower the probability of finding per finding pers in processing fluids in the next uh, week. So when you get to about eight weeks of consecutive negative results, you'd have a very low chance of finding it in the, in the next uh, uh, sampling. But here we have a comparison of uh, weekly processing fluid samples testing and family oral fluids from the same cohorts. And what we are showing here is that those sample types not always agree. You can have uh, a cohort that was positive in processing fluids and then when they get to winning, uh, family oral fluids was not able to detect. But the other way around is also possible where you don't find that group at positive at processing but when they get to the winning time, you are able to find virus in that same group. So in what, the, what does that mean? That means that you can probably not rely on just one or the other for an optimal uh, sample or for an optimal detection of PERS in your breeding herd, because you can have these situations where you have disagreements. In this case here, farm B, had nine in 11 weeks of processing fluids negative results, but we were able to find uh, those groups with uh, positive results on family oral fluids at weaning. Uh, the other interesting finding here is that we have these intermittent patterns of detection where you have weeks that are positive, uh, followed by weeks that are negative, and then, uh, you know, you can have another positive week. But that same pattern can also happen within the same week between rooms within the same week. So you would have rooms that are negative and rooms that are positive in both processing fluids and for infemineral fluids in the same week. And that just highlights how important it is to sample aggressively across different rooms so we, we don't miss a chance to find PERS in the right room. 
So here we have a comparison about family oral fluids and serum samples and, and how we are showing here uh, what would be the sample size necessary uh, or in which sample size, if you don't detect purse, what would be the meaning of that? So let's say that you're sampling about 60 pigs and all those samples test negative. You could still have a prevalence of about, about 5% and that would be the same for family oral fluids with eight samples. So it's important here that when all samples test negative, that we remember that that doesn't mean that our, our population is negative. That means that we could still have a high, a high, it could be negative, but it could also mean that the prevalence is about 5% and we just miss it. Uh, so to get uh, to a confidence level that the prevalence is about 2% or lower, we would have to sample about 133 piglets uh, with individual sampling using serum, for example, and about 30 samples with family oral fluids. Now, uh, getting here to the end of our journey, what happens when your herd tests negative, for example, for 12 weeks? Am I stable yet? So in this herd, we were following this herd after load close exposure strategy. Here at uh, week 23, this herd that uh, had uh, processing fluids, five consecutive positive weeks with processing fluids, red means positive, blue means negative. And then they, we, they went 14 weeks of consecutive negative results with processing fluids. But then that was followed by uh, finding processing fluids positive two out of seven with CTs of about 30 and 36. That were heard went again five weeks of consecutive ne negative results. So they were asking if this could be, you know, a false positive results. But then at 44 weeks, we had uh, positive results again. It was showing that we have um, some, some circulation of viruses still in that herd even after 44 weeks post load, uh, load close and expose strategy implemented. And here we have, uh, you know, the same farm actually that was monitoring with, uh, monitored with serum samples and, and, family, uh, and processing fluid samples. In 10 months span of time, we, we all the serum samples, which were about 30 piglets per uh, each month, all of those samples tested positive, but processing fluid was telling a very different story. So with all these, what do, we, do I want you to, to have in mind is that uh, we have as take homes here, infectious purse can be found in the individual pigs for a long time and can also be found in breeding herds for a very long time. But we actually lack information about the persistence of PERS under field conditions in South. So more studies are needed to understand what we have there. Also, we have the impact of these new uh, sampling uh, strategies with processing fluids, familiar fluids, and even be uh, better protocols with serum samples that are apparently uh, making our herds to have longer time to stability. So another important uh, take home here is that the combination of these different strategies that we showed here is probably what's going to yield the best results of being able to find that PERS virus in the breeding herds and also the frequency of testing matter. So if we increase our, sequency, our frequency and also our sample size, we are going to increase rep representativeness with, with that, be able to find PERS more easily in our breeding herds. So what we are suggesting right now is to have at least eight weeks of negative processing fluids results and to use less pooling as time goes by. And to say that our herds are, are, are uh, stable, that would also require another six additional weeks with some due tree to impiglet testing, and that would, could be achieved with family oral fluids or other techniques. And it would be recommended that you increase your sample size to be able to detect the prevalence of at least one to 2%. With that, I would like to say thank you to my team at Iowa State, to the team that I work with, and with my advisor, Dr. Daniel Liaris, and I'll be taking any questions if there is any. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo, for your presentation. Our last speaker today is Dr. Daryl Holtkamp from Iowa State University. 
Dr. Holtkamp is a professor in the Department of Veterinary Diagnostics and Production Animal Medicine at Iowa State University. He received his DVM and MS in Agricultural Economics and BS in Agricultural Business with a minor in Statistics. And those degrees were all from Iowa State University. Before joining Iowa State as a professor, he also worked as a private veterinary consultant and as a technical services veterinarian. He has authored over 40 peer-reviewed publications and he's a frequent speaker in the US and internationally with over 175 invited presentations. And he has also mentored over 200 professional and graduate students. A little background on his presentation. The first task force committee of the AASV voted to revisit the classification guidelines at the annual meeting back two years ago. And as such, a working group was formed to propose modifications to the PERS virus classification system. These modifications were reviewed and approved by the Board of direct Directors at ASV in the fall of last year. And the presentation today from Dr. Holkamp is entitled AASV PERS virus classification changes, and it will describe the modifications uh, that were done to the PERS classification. Thank you, and Andrea. Thank you for chairing the session, and, and uh, I appreciate the invitation to speak to you today here. So uh, what I'm going to cover uh, in the next 30 minutes is uh, some background information on the, the PERS uh, classification system uh, that we've had, and, and then I'm going to cover some modifications that have just recently now been proposed uh, to that classification system. So we'll start with a little background. Uh, the, uh, the original PERS virus classification system was developed uh, by a definitions committee that was uh, uh, formed back in 2009. Uh, Dr. Bob Morrison chaired that, uh, that committee. Uh, and it was funded by the American Association of Swine Veterinarians. And uh, at that time, uh, there was a, a USDA uh, PERS cap that also contributed uh, some funds to that, to that effort. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, the committee's work there, the herd classification system, um, it was, uh, the, the committee came, came up with was proposed and presented to the um, ASV Board of Directors. Uh, prior to that, it had been uh, uh, vetted through the ASV PERS Task Force, who uh, basically recommended to the board that that system be approved. And so the Board of Directors of ASV then did that in March of 2010. And so just briefly, some of the things uh, that that, uh, uh, that classification system allowed us to do or facilitated, uh, the, one of the big ones was just communication. Uh, so the ability to have a common language uh, for veterinarians to talk to each other uh, or to talk to their producers uh, was, 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 a, was a, a very significant uh, a, a advantage that, uh, that we didn't have before that. Um, it was also used uh, or has been used a lot by researchers uh, as is evidenced by the fact that that publication that described the classification system uh, was published in JSHAP. Uh, it has been cited uh, over 106 times. And uh, it's also been translated into German uh, and other, lang or in other languages, foreign languages, including German. And so it's, uh, it's been fairly adopted, adopted fairly worldwide as well. Um, and then probably the most significant thing that it contributed is it really provided a roadmap for managing PERS uh, virus uh, with well-defined destinations, depending on the goal. And so if your goal was uh, to control PERS virus, uh, then your destination was a, a positive, stable category two herd. Uh, on the other hand, if your goal was to eliminate uh, PERS virus from, from breeding herd, your goal was to be a, a negative category four herd. Uh, and, and that was the case whether you were doing it by herd closure and rollover or by complete depop, repop. And so uh, I've given a lot of thought to this recently, and, and you know, there's opportunities to learn from what's going on with the pandemic here as well. But uh, uh, I guess, you know, think about uh, if we had something similar to the PERS classification system uh, for COVID. Uh, you know, would, would that have, uh, or would that allow us to manage this, uh, this in infectious disease better than, than what we're doing? Uh, and I think, uh, in my mind, it, it absolutely would. In fact, it, it, it probably suggests uh, or gives uh, uh, me reason to believe that, you know, as, as uh, in terms of managing infectious disease, I think we do a better job uh, of doing that uh, for pigs than we do for people in this country. So uh, I'll, I'll say that specifically for the U.S. I don't want to speak for other countries, but, um, but in fact, I uh, kind of got my interest peaked in this and I Googled uh, what is the goal with COVID uh, and COVID-19. 
And um, uh, this uh, website uh, came up as the CDC's uh, main website. Uh, and they actually have a, a, a goal, uh, response goal and objective statement. Uh, but if you read that, you know, it has words like limit human to human transmission, minimize the impact of COVID-19, reduce specific threats. Uh, there's nothing measurable in any of that. Uh, it's, it's just limit, max, uh, minimize and reduce. Uh, and, and so I, I don't know how you manage anything with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, that as a goal or objective. So um, I just wanted to bring, point that out that, uh, you know, this is one of the things I think we're, you know, we're fortunate we have this classification system uh, for PERS virus in, in the U.S. and some other infectious diseases as well, including uh, mycoplasma high and ammonia now that will be published soon. Uh, another thing it did uh, or uh, does and, and, and did uh, is facilitate monitoring efforts. So, so Bob Morrison, as I mentioned, chaired the, uh, that, that definitions committee. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, or soon after that, uh, he started this effort with the Swine Health Monitoring Project. Uh, Cesar Corzo has continued that today and uh, basically using the PERS virus classification that, uh, that was developed. And so it really did uh, serve to facilitate that, that ability to monitor um, you know, breeding herds according to the PERS virus status. Um, and so if, you, if, you, if you're not familiar with the original classification system, this is what it looked like. Uh, so we had a positive, unstable category one, two, and then positive, stable category two, uh, which was split into uh, A for eliminating, B for not eliminating, and then provisional negative, and then negative category four here. And, and the status um, in each case, or the category was dependent on the shedding status, and the, as well as the exposure status. Uh, and, and so um, that, that has not changed, but, uh, but we did make some uh, modifications to the to the new system. So why, why was there a call to make modifications? Um, you know, we've had several developments since the first classification was published in 2011. Uh, we had challenges with um, uh, consistently weaning groups of pigs negative for PERS virus from positive stable herds. Uh, so, so during the first, uh, or the, you know, the committee that, that came up with the, the first uh, go around of the classification system, this was a big topic of, of discussion. Um, you know, what, what is the supporting evidence or what should the supporting evidence uh, be for classifying a herd as a positive stable uh, category two herd? And, and, and just to, to remind you that the, the, the thing that, that characterizes these herds is the ability to wean uh, negative pigs on a consistent basis uh, in a herd that, that is otherwise has, uh, is seropositive. But, um, and, and so the, you know, the debate in the first go around was, was uh, how much evidence, uh, how much diagnostic evidence uh, do we need uh, to promote a herd to this category? And, uh, and, I, and I think there was, uh, uh, you know, uh, or I don't think there was a, a, some balancing between uh, the amount of evidence and the cost of acquiring that evidence and the, and, the, and the inconvenience of getting that evidence. And so there was sort of a compromise there. And, and I think the committee uh, recognized that uh, the limitations of that, and that's why we end up call, using the term uncertain for the shedding status uh, for, this, uh, for these herds. Um, but but I think it, it, in, in subsequent years, it led to sort of some people to question the sufficiency uh, of that supporting evidence for these herds because, um, uh, you know, as, as you probably, many of you have had uh, cases of where you, you get a herd that uh, is, is classified as positive stable category two and then occasionally it'll, it'll, uh, it'll pop some positive pigs. And so um, it, it's not, uh, not something that, that uh, is perfect and, and we knew it wasn't going to be perfect at the time. Uh, and then to further exacerbate things, uh, you know, it seems, uh, at least the perception is that there's been an evolution of some new isolates uh, of PERS virus that are more challenging uh, to, to uh, stabilize uh, sow farms for. And, and so, you know, that, that frustration, I, can't, I think, kind of led to the desire to rethink this as well. Um, also been development of new sample types, uh, including oral fluids and processing fluids. Uh, and then even some new uh, uh, diagnostic tests, so uh, whole genome sequencing, uh, clamping PCRs, and so forth. And so there was some, uh, you know, uh, desire then, I guess, to include, incorporate some of these new sample types and diagnostic tests into the classification system, or at least into the supporting evidence uh, for the classification uh, system. So, uh, talk a little bit about then what the proposed changes uh, to the system are or were. Uh, first, a little background on, on how this was done. Uh, the PERS uh, Task Force Committee uh, met uh, at the annual meeting in 2018 and, and voted then to revisit the classification guidelines. Um, and so uh, based on that, uh, a working group was, was formed. 
Uh, and then uh, modifications then were proposed um, by that, that working group uh, through, I think uh, we ended up meeting three times uh, over about a year and a half and then put together a white paper. That white paper was, was uh, reviewed uh, then and approved by the board of directors of ASV uh, in the fall of 2019. And so there will, um, there's a um, uh, manuscript uh, that's presently in, uh, in, in review or being reviewed by, by Jay Shap. And hopefully that will be out by the end of, of the year describing the, the new classification system. Uh, changes then uh, that were uh, suggested or made, uh, proposed, I'll say by the working group, uh, included raising the bar uh, on, on supporting evidence to, uh, to promote herds into at least category two, that was done. Uh, and the desire here again was to reinforce that definition of stability. Uh, again, a herd that could consistently wean negative pigs. And, and so um, uh, the, again, the, the, the amount of diagnostic evidence was raised. Uh, the flip side of that, that, that could make it a little bit easier though to, to, uh, to collect that diagnostic information or get it. Uh, was that uh, we included options for alternative sample types. So able to use uh, processing fluids and family oral fluids, uh, which are obviously easier to collect than, than serum. Uh, so here's the changes then to the, to the categories. Uh, again, you hopefully note here that uh, po uh, positive unstable, uh, previously just one category, uh, has now been divided into uh, two categories. Positive unstable, high prevalence will be 1A, and then positive unstable, low prevalence will be 1B. And um, the, the, uh, the idea here or, or the uh, thinking uh, for this was that we have a, a, a lot of these herds, a lot of these sow herds that, uh, you know, the goal, uh, the, the goal is control and, and they, they have tried to get them to positive stable category two, but uh, just not able to get them there. Uh, but yet the productivity uh, in those herds, as well as the downstream pigs, uh, tends to be pretty good. And, and so there was a desire to, uh, to establish that sort of as a destination for control. Uh, and so that's why the, uh, the split between those two categories. Uh, positive stable uh, category, uh, we got rid of the 1A, 1B, meaning eliminating or not eliminating, and basically made it 2 and 2BX. So 2 is um, uh, positive stable, uh, not using uh, vaccine, modified live vaccine, uh, whereas positive stable uh, category 2BX is, is using modified live uh, vaccine in the, in the herd, um, in, the, in the breeding herd itself. And then uh, provisional negative category three and uh, negative category four were left unchanged. Uh, so we'll dig into a little bit more detail in each of those changes. Um, category uh, uh, one, positive unstable, was, uh, was uh, like I mentioned, uh, subdivided. Uh, basically, category 1A now, the high prevalence category, replaced the old uh, category one. So by that, I mean, uh, you, you don't need any evidence. Um, in fact, if you lack evidence, diagnostic evidence to support uh, being in any other category, uh, by default, you're in category 1A. And, and so that, that basically was what uh, previously was category 1 was the, the category of default. So again, positive exposure status, uh, a positive high prevalence uh, shedding status as well. Uh, so the new category, though, or subcategory, was positive, unstable, uh, low prevalence, category 1B. Uh, st positive exposure status, still a positive shedding status, but, but at low prevalence. Um, the criteria is that these are herds that, um, uh, after 90 days of uh, low prevalence in weaned pigs, uh, can be declared uh, or promoted to category 1B. The supporting evidence that's necessary to do that or to, to, to meet that criteria uh, includes monthly uh, testing by PCR of serum uh, from weaning age pigs, uh, 30 samples, uh, pools of five. And, and here's the difference now. This, uh, you may recognize this as being very similar to what used to be the criteria for uh, positive stable, uh, to, to promote a herd to a positive stable category two. Uh, but the difference is now they, uh, they don't have to have a positive result every single time uh, on the monthly testing. They just have to have it uh, at least 75% of the time, or three out of four. Uh, and so that's, uh, again, uh, the, the definition then of, of, of low prevalence. So they can occasionally have that positive uh, PCR on serum from weaned pigs and still be uh, classified as category 1B. Um, some of the alternative sample types uh, that were uh, um, introduced uh, here into the, the supporting el uh, evidence for category 1B uh, included uh, weekly testing of processing fluids. So, the, so as an alternative to collecting serum from weaned pigs, 
Uh, you can collect one or more pools of processing fluids that you're going to test by PCR. Uh, that should come from a majority of pigs processed during uh, the week. Uh, and same thing as with the serum, you just have to have 75% uh, of those weekly samplings over a 90-day um, period uh, need to be negative. Okay, so that's, uh, if, you, if you do the math, that's 10 out of 13 weeks need to be uh, negative, at least 10 out of 13. Um, and then this I've highlighted here, and you'll see why in a, in a few slides here, but uh, what, what, uh, what is not required is that you do any parallel testing of serum uh, from weaning age pigs. Okay, and so this, this you'll see will vary when we get into the positive stable category where uh, we want to be more confident about the status of the wean pig as opposed to the a processing age pig. And then uh, vaccines, uh, modified live vaccines may be used in 1B uh, herds. Uh, in the old system, there was no distinction made for herds that were vaccinated or not vaccinated. Uh, and, and, uh, and so now we've made accommodations for modified live uh, vaccine use in the, in the system. Uh, but, uh, but positive results uh, that, that uh, may be due to modified live vaccine, positive results on PCR tests, uh, <clears throat> will we'll get sorted out uh, in the new system. What we're recommending then is, is first of all, that you vaccinate before, I'm sorry, uh, test before you vaccinate. Uh, but if you do uh, end up back or testing within a two week period after MLV, um, we're gonna say that we're gonna consider that a, a, a positive result due to MLV and deem that a negative test for the purpose of classification. Uh, if you're past that two week window, then you can use molecular diagnostic methods that may be uh, used to distinguish wild type virus from vaccine virus. So that in would include OR5 sequencing, uh, whole genome sequencing, or, or using real-time uh, PCR clamping assays. And, and so you, you, you probably will recognize that there's, there's um, uh, some, uh, ho hopefully will recognize that there's uh, not every detail about how this would be done is covered here. We wanted to not be overly prescriptive. Uh, it'll still be up to the veterinarians to kind of how they decide to do this. Uh, this, in particular, using this grace period will be one I suspect that will be a little bit controversial. Uh, but, uh, but again, there's a lot of leeway in here uh, for the veterinarian to kind of decide how best to do this. Uh, positive stable category two, then. Uh, this, again, as it was in the first go around uh, for the original classification system, was a hot topic. Uh, took a lot of our time. Um, but the, the, the working group really wanted to try to reinforce that definition of stable. I think over time, uh, that's gotten a little bit washed. Uh, and so we want to reinforce that stable means uh, that you have evidence uh, that, that shedding and transmission of the virus in the herd has, uh, has stopped or shedding to transmission, I'm sorry, to susceptible animals has uh, ceased or stopped. And, and that's going to be characterized then primarily by uh, the ability to consistently wean uh, a negative pig, pig because they're, they're uh, our, our, our most significant susceptible um, population in a, in a breeding herd. And so the, the, the working group, uh, in order to raise the bar then on what we mean by stable and, and the evidence required to do that, uh, then uh, added some additional uh, diagnostic uh, uh, requirements uh, to get to that category. And so uh, here's, um, here's the old uh, syst uh, category two. Uh, and, and again, as I mentioned, uh, we've, we've got done away with the, the splitting category two according to whether they were planning to eliminate the virus or, or not. Uh, that really wasn't used, and so we went instead with the two and two VX with vaccine. Uh, but this is the same criteria here that uh, for category two as we had in the old system. Uh, again, positive exposure status, uh, uncertain shedding status, 90-day uh, period uh, evidence with the 90-day period of sustained lack of viremia in uh, weaning age pigs, uh, and, and that's going to be proven that criteria by monthly testing of serum from weaning age pigs by PCR. 30 samples, pulls of fives. Uh, no positive results over a 90-day uh, period, so four consecutive uh, uh, negative tests. All right, the change that was made. Now I'm going to I'm going to flash to the next slide, and and you'll note that only two things will change on that slide, or three, I guess. And that is is that the number of samples has been doubled to 60, but instead of pulls of five, we're going to go pulls of 10. So the the, the cost of running the test is going to be the same, still five tests. Uh, but we're doubling the number of pigs we're sampling to hopefully improve the sensitivity then of that, the diagnostic sensitivity of that sampling strategy. Uh, but everything else is the same. S still need 90 days uh, sustained viremia. Uh, still going to demonstrate that with uh, uh, four consecutive uh, negative tests, uh, monthly negative tests. And, and the third thing I changed on this slide here was this uh, uncertain shedding status. That is still not 
uh, uh, the same or still is the same, um, but hopefully with with more certainty or more certain than the old system. Uh, so we're still didn't abandon the uncertain term with uh, with negative here yet. All right, positive uh, stable category two. Then uh, for that category, the the diagnostic evidence required. Um, uh, we consider the, the working group uh, wanted to include some some alternative sample types uh, to testing serum from due to wean pigs and so processing fluids was added um, the problem you have uh, run into here or, or the, the thing you want to keep in mind is that uh, results for processing fluids or uh, do not necessarily correlate with PERS virus infections in pigs at weaning and 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 that's really what we uh, for classifying a herd as positive stable category two it's that status at weaning that we really need to know because that, that is what um, uh, will demonstrate then uh, whether virus is being actively shed and transmitted in that herd uh, or not. And so we still need to understand that PERS virus shedding status of pigs at weaning to establish a, a herd as being stable. Um, and so to, uh, uh, to do that, uh, to include processing fluids, uh, we, we added uh, the working group added weekly testing uh, as well as, and big and there, uh, monthly testing of serum from fewer uh, due to wean pigs. So uh, if you wanted to incorporate processing fluids, you can cut back on the number of um, uh, wean pigs you need to bleed. Uh, so for the processing fluid, part of that, one or more pools of processing fluids tested by PCR. Uh, again, majority of the pigs processed during the week. Uh, and, and so this should be very, uh, looked familiar. This is what uh, we had from category 1B. What's different though then from 1B is instead of 75% of the tests being negative, you need all of them uh, being negative, 13 to 13 over a 90 day period. And, and again, I'll just emphasize that you need to do this in parallel with testing of serum, uh, but instead of 60 pigs like you, you would do with serum alone, you can, you can do it for uh, only bleed 30 pigs. And again, test them in pools of five. All right, uh, for the, the category 2VX, which was added by the working group. Um, that's uh, basically the same as category two, except you can use modified live vaccine in the, in the sow farm or in the, in the breeding herd. And, and so the, uh, all the criteria is the, the criteria is the same. The supporting evidence uh, is, is again, the same. Um, this uh, looks familiar, hopefully from the, the discussion of category one B uh, using the same basic uh, criteria, uh, Again, it's recommending you test before you vaccinate. Uh, if you do uh, test within two weeks of vaccination, you get that grace period. Uh, and then uh, otherwise you can use um, the, the molecular, other mo molecular diagnostic testing uh, strategies to, to distinguish between wild type and, and uh, vaccine-like virus. Uh, also for category 2BX, we can include weekly testing with processing fluids just as we did uh, with category two. So, so fundamentally category two and 2BX are the same. Uh, with the exception that you can use uh, vaccine, and so you got the additional complication of of needing to sometimes rule um, or distinguish between wild type and vaccine-like virus. Uh, provisional negative category three and negative category four are the same as they as they were in the old system, so uh, we won't uh, discuss those any further. Uh, the uh, next thing the working group did was then to um, uh, include or add some uh, supporting evidence required to maintain a herd in the category. So uh, in the first go around, the first classification system, uh, all the supporting evidence was what was required to promote a herd uh, into a category. Uh, there was no uh, guidance given for maintaining a herd in, in those categories. And, and that was a, a purposeful dis decision. Uh, the working group thought it was time to go ahead and include um, that some uh, criteria or supporting evidence to maintain a herd uh, in a category once it's already been promoted there. And, and so that was uh, added for each category except category 1A, where uh, again, that's a category de by default. Uh, no evidence is required to, uh, to land in that category or uh, put a herd in that category. So, uh, so there's no maintenance requirements for category 1A. Uh, but for all the other categories, the maintenance uh, uh, supporting evidence is uh, essentially either the same uh, or it would be done less frequently. Uh, compared to what's required to promote a herd into that category. Um, one thing that was, was done though was there are more alternative sampling stra uh, testing strategies uh, included that uh, included the alternative sample types, especially uh, processing fluids and, and family oral fluids were included as well to kind of try to uh, ease the, uh, the requirements or burden uh, cost and, and time uh, required to produce the diagnostic evidence. All right. 
So uh, we'll spend the last uh, part of this uh, presentation then on, on kind of uh, what the new classification system means in terms of this roadmap uh, for uh, managing PERS, whether your goal is to control or eliminate. And so just a kind of overview here under the old system, uh, if your goal was to control, you had a single destination and that was a, a positive stable uh, category two. Uh, and if your goal was to eliminate over here, you also had a single destination and that was a category four uh, negative herd. Uh, there was just two, two ways to get there, either by uh, complete depop, repop or herd closure and rollover. Under the new system though, if your goal is to control, you now have two uh, destinations uh, and, and we've debated you could potentially uh, consider category uh, two without vaccination uh, to be a third uh, goal as well. So that would be maintaining a herd uh, as a, a positive stable herd without using MLV vaccine. Um, but, uh, but fundamentally, um, I think it's not that much different. So I haven't included it on, on this chart here, but there are two <clears throat> now destinations uh, if your goal is to control, the other being the positive unstable uh, uh, low prevalence category 1B. So that is considered a des destination now for control. Uh, eliminate hasn't changed. Your destination is category four. All right, so we'll go into a little bit of detail here uh, then on each of these. Um, so if your goal then is to control uh, and, your, and your goal is uh, uh, destination, I should say, is a positive unstable uh, herd with low prevalence, uh, this is how you get there. Uh, this broadly a timeline without specific times on it, but uh, we'll start out as a, a category 1A positive unstable herd with high prevalence. So this might uh, you know, be right after an outbreak occurs. Uh, and then over time, if your con uh, efforts to control or, or stabilize the herd are, are working, uh, you're going to reduce the prevalence uh, uh, in the herd uh, and, and essentially uh, get fewer and fewer positive tests in wean pigs. And then once you get to that 75% threshold, uh, over a 90-day period, you can you can uh, that herd can be promoted into the positive, unstable, uh, category 1B low prevalence herd, and then the goal will then be just to maintain that herd as a 1B with with a uh, uh, with or without uh, vaccine use. If your destination for control is now positive, stable with vaccine, though, uh, same setup here. You start out with a positive, unstable, high prevalence herd, maybe right after an outbreak. Uh, eventually you get it to a positive, unstable, low prevalence, uh, category 1B, uh, but you're not going to stop there. You, you continue your stabilization efforts until you can get uh, consistently weaning negative pigs, uh, four, four consecutive negative tests uh, over 90 days um, with use of modified live vaccine. And now you can call that a category 2B X herd, and then you'll be, that herd will be maintained there again as the, as the destination for control. Uh, on the elimination side, really no different here, but I'll run through that real quickly for uh, herd closure and rollover. Uh, again, you start out as a positive, unstable, uh, high prevalence category 1A, advance to 1B, uh, eventually get it to positive, stable category 2. And then at this point, you're going to make a decision now to, to no longer acclimate guilts. You're going to enter a, a naive or a, a guilt that's uh, never uh, been exposed to PERS virus before or uh, groups of guilts that have never been exposed. Uh, and then uh, if, you can, if you can have those gilts in the herd for uh, at least 60 days, uh, commingling with the other animals in the herd, uh, you know, where they're essentially serving as a sentinel uh, animal for you, if they, if they remain negative, both seronegative and negative by PCR, uh, then, then you can promote that herd to provisional negative, category three, uh, with still some, some seropositive animals in that herd. Uh, eventually, you'll, you'll roll out all those previously exposed seropositive animals and get an entirely seronegative herd. And then at that point, you'll be a negative category four. Uh, again, which is the destination, you'll maintain that as a category four. Uh, finally, for complete depop, repop, uh, more complicated to do, but easier to explain. Uh, basically, you start out again, same place as a positive, unstable, high prevalence herd. Uh, you depopulate that herd, repopulate with a completely uh, naive population in your uh, at category four, uh, negative category four already. And so again, that's uh, the goal then will be to maintain that herd um, as a category four herd. With that then, I uh, uh, wanna thank uh, uh, the American Association of Swine Veterinarians uh, for uh, providing funding for travel expenses and other meeting expenses, uh, as well as Maddie Her uh, Herring, who's a, a, a veterinary student at Iowa State University, uh, who provided a lot of great help uh, in preparation of the manuscript. 
And then I want to thank again the organizing committee of the Allen D. Uh, Lehman uh, Swine Conference for the invitation to speak with you here today. So I hope you enjoyed these presentations and learned something new about PERS today during this session. Thank you, Dr. Holkamp, and thank you for all the speakers.